Okay, yeah, yes, go. Good morning, and welcome to United Presbyterian Church on this beautiful Sunday morning. Um, if we are chilly, it looks like starting Tuesday or Wednesday, we're going to be in the low 50s and 40s, so a lot of this white stuff will probably be going away. So, uh, yeah, yeah, although uh, we have definitely enjoyed the snow. My son has been out in it every day playing in it, making igloos. I haven't seen this much snow since 77, <laughs> since the blizzard when we lived in New York City as a kid. So, I'm enjoying it too. Uh, a couple of announcements this morning. Um, our normal um, uh, our normal events will be continuing this week on Zoom. The Bible study on Tuesday evening, 6 p.m. And then, of course, our prayer meeting on Thursday evening at 6.30 p.m. Uh, both of those will be continuing on Zoom. Um, I believe those are the only announcements I have this morning. Are there any other announcements in the sanctuary or on Zoom? Hearing none, then, let us worship God. Together with Christ, 
Christ and raised us up with him. For by grace you have saved, been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. Amen. And now for the scripture, it's taken from Mark 1, verses 9 through 13. And it's one of my favorites because it has the word dove in it. And I was telling Benjamin before the service, he should have been playing on the wings of a dove. It's an old country song that I love so much. And this part of the scripture is mentioned in that song. This is about the baptism and temptation of Jesus. Verse 9. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. As Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. At once the Spirit sent him out into the desert, and he was in the desert forty days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and the angels attended him. Thanks be to God uh, for the word of the Lord. Amen. big a pulpit is you always need more space. <laughs> I feel like it's the minister's desk away from their desk. <laughs> While the pancakes have been eaten and our griddles are cold, even at our homes, and we have traded in our Dixieland music for a reflection on our humanity. Going back to Ash Wednesday, we are told from the dust of the earth we were created, and to the dust we shall return. We make the shift 
early on, from feasting to fasting, because we have begun our spiritual journeys with Jesus of Nazareth through the wilderness. Because the season of Lent is now upon the church. And when we think about this season, millions of Christians have chosen to give things up. Millions of Christians have chosen to fast. Millions of Christians have chosen to begin a spiritual discipline. And millions of Christians choose not to observe the season of Lent. But for those who choose to participate, any discipline or sacrifice that edifies one's spiritual life, in my opinion, is a welcomed practice. So as we enter this season of fasting, it might be a good idea to raise the question to fast or not to fast. I think that was in Shakespeare's amended version of his, of his works. Uh, now I'm going to be sued by Shakespearean families all around England. As mainline Christians that follow the liturgical calendar, it is important to understand why we do what we do. Right? I've always been a believer in that. Right? If you are a Christian, you should know your Bible, right? And as mainline Christians, as Presbyterians, as we celebrate these holy days or these seasons that we do, right? It's the reason why we wear purple. We should know why we do it. So let's begin by taking a deeper look into the season of sacrifice. Starting with the term itself. Where does the season of Lent come from? And this is really interesting. I dug a little bit deeper than I usually do. The season initially has its origins within the Latin word, you ready for this? Quadrag, quadragesima, quadragesima. Now for our Latin speakers out there, I'm sure I've massacred that word. But it is the Latin term which means 40, which referred to the 40 hours of fasting that preceded Easter. Okay, now you're going way far back to the very early church. The 40 hours would culminate with the baptisms of the new initiates on the eve of Easter, right? These are the individuals that would go through their catechisms um, and... Uh, to our children now, uh, you have it easy compared to the early Christian converts who would, I believe sometimes it would be for almost two years that they would go through the instruction and then to be baptized on the eve of Easter, right? So before their baptism, it would be a 40 hours of fasting before the baptism would take place. The fast was to prepare those who would receive the sacrament of baptism. Now, eventually the period of fasting grew to six days to represent the six weeks of training to instruct certain converts. And I have an extra piece of paper. When I first turned the page, I said, uh-oh, here's a blank page of my sermon. But there's not. Now, in the Middle Ages, as messages began to go out into common vernacular, including the English language, the term is changed to the English word of Lent, which means spring, right? So initially it was not Lent, initially it was not spring, but it kind of morphed into it. The modern season of Lent has become one of self-reflection and self-sacrifice, which stems all the way back into the early church. It is a season which leads into Good Friday and Easter Sunday, a metaphorical journey with Christ through the wilderness. And like its origins, it is a season of preparation. Now, another question that is continually raised 
is the season of Lent biblical? Right? And I get that question actually quite often. So, well, not literally. But the season of Lent is based on an actual event that occurs during the life of Jesus of Nazareth. As Christ fasted in the wilderness for 40 days after his baptism at or in the river Jordan. The church chooses to metaphorically journey and fast with Jesus for those 40 days, which begins with Ash Wednesday. Looking once more into St. Mark's account. And the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness for 40 days, tempted by Satan. And he was with wild beasts, and the angels waited upon him. Again, Mark's gospel is concise and to the point, leaving us with very little detail about Jesus' time out in the wilderness. <coughs> Now, Mark surprises readers who are familiar with the dramatic exchange between Satan and Jesus that can be found in Matthew and Luke's Gospels, right? There are no three temptations within Mark's account. The entire account is encapsulated in a single verse, and yet there is plenty that can be gleaned. Jesus is out in the wilderness being tested by Satan for 40 days. It is an echo of the Israelites wandering and being tested by God in the wilderness for 40 years. We are also told that Jesus was with wild animals. And then afterwards, the angels waited upon him, tending to his needs. Now this is an important piece to the verse and needs not to be overlooked. What is the purpose for Mark letting us know that Jesus is out in the wilderness with wild beasts? It's an interesting piece. Commentaries and theologians ponder perhaps to show the perils of being out in the wilderness. Or perhaps to show that Jesus is an antitype Adam in the garden. As the enmity between humans and animals is a direct consequence from Adam's rebellion, and this does not apply to Jesus. Right? And Jesus is mentioned uh, or is um, compared to Adam in multiple places, right? And as the anti-Adam, as this, as Jesus is fully human, as he is fully divine, right? And so being out in the wilderness can be perilous. This is the reason why shepherds carry those big sticks when they are out there with their flocks, right? It's not to look cool. It's to make sure that they keep away the wild animals, wild dogs, or wolves from their flock. The verse ends with the angels waiting and tending to Jesus' needs. As we must always remember, as I just mentioned, after a 40-day fast must have, must have been very hard on Jesus' human body. He probably was weak, tired, and hungry. We must never forget that although Jesus is fully divine, he is also fully human. Going that long without food in the wilderness must have taxed his body something terrible. The wilderness is also symbolic for in biblical times to represent human sinfulness. So when we think about what Jesus had to just go through, he was out in the wilderness and it represents the sin around him. For Jesus, it is a period of sacrifice, reflection, testing, 
and at the end he is nourished. And so when we think about the wilderness, here is Jesus and it is all around him. It is moving on him. His body continually weakens, right? So it's not that Jesus is tested when he is at his strongest. He is tested when his human body is at its weakest, right? So that is important theologically to note. So whether we are discussing the Israelites wandering in the wilderness or John the Baptist preparing the way for Christ in the wilderness, the, when we have wilderness, especially within the New Testament, it represents human sinfulness, a period of temptation or testing. And the beautiful thing is, is that Jesus, although he is at his weakness, his human body is probably hurting, he is able to persevere through it. He comes through it, right? He beats Satan at Satan's game. He is able to come through that period of testing, right? And so it is a powerful example of, of what Jesus is able to do. So here we are, some 2,000 years later, observing Lent as a community of believers. I mean, observing Lent amid a horrible pandemic. And like so many disciplines that the church takes part in, they all involve actions. An action that begins with following Jesus into the wilderness. Because that is what we symbolically do throughout the season of Lent. Right? So when we observe Lent, it's not that, okay, we sit down and we just read some stories. And this is why perhaps it is important to observe Lent with an activity, right? So whether we are, you know, giving things up, whether we are taking on uh, a devotion, whether we are taking on a spiritual discipline, or whether we are, uh, we want to correct a behavior or give up meat or whatever you're looking to do. It is the action that we are accompanying with uh, our time of meditation and devotion. For the church, we follow Christ and we are tested by life itself. We follow Christ by fasting, by sacrificing, by taking up disciplines. We follow Christ by reflecting on our frailty, right? And a wonderful example of this is Ash Wednesday. We follow Christ by preparing for the cross and the empty grave. And we follow Christ by allowing ourselves to be nourished by the things that come from God, right? As Jesus was nourished by the angelic host, we are also nourished by things that come from God. So during this season of Lent, of sacrifice, of taking on disciplines, allow God to nourish you throughout your spiritual journeys. Prayer, the reading of scripture, uh, working through a devotional, um, spending time with God, allowing God to nourish you throughout this season. So as we wander, we must understand that we do not wander aimlessly, right? It's not that we're out in the desert just walking around because we are totally lost, right? That's not what is happening here uh, throughout the season of Lent. As the church, we wander with each other, right? It is directed, if you want to think of it in that way, right? Think of it as... We must think and understand that Jesus was pushed out into the wilderness, right? He was pushed out, forced out into the wilderness. And we are doing the same. But we do not wander with no purpose. Because one, we wander with each other. The church goes together. We all go together, hand in hand. And we are with Jesus Christ as we 
spend time in the wilderness. Right? So we're not alone. We're with each other and we are with God. So as we metaphorically, as we spiritually wander the wilderness throughout the season of Lent, we do it with each other. We do it with God. So may God guide us as we are spiritually cast out into the wilderness. Whether we are praying that extra prayer, or reading that additional passage from the scriptures, or whether we are fasting by abstaining from chocolate, coffee, sweets, or red meat, we must remember to keep a smile on our faces, and we must remember to stay positive, seeking the Spirit of God throughout our journey, listening and feeling the guidance of the Holy Spirit, all the while focusing on Christ's journey. Christ's ultimate sacrifice on the cross and the resurrection that we celebrate on Easter Sunday. As Lent always, always points to Easter and the resurrection of our Lord, which is the reason for our faith. So stay strong throughout the season of Lent. Stay busy. And God speed to all of us on our Christian journey. To God be all the glory, honor, and praise this day and every day. Amen. Amen. As it has been part of the tradition of this congregation, let us lift up our voices as we <coughs> affirm our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. What do we believe? I believe, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We have now come to the point within our worship service where we are able to lift up our concerns, our prayers, the, the things that lie heavy upon our hearts and our souls. So what would you like to lift up in prayer this morning? What joys would you like to share? I have one already from Miriam about her hand. So we'll be praying for Miriam's hand. What other prayer requests this morning? Continued prayers for Sue, please. Continued prayers. Sue Lormer? Yes. That was Bob, I assume. Sue Lormer. Got it. Thank you, Bob. I'll do travel mercies for Sue Hale and Alejandra as I can see them driving right now. <laughs> <laughs> ah, technology. <laughs> And they're traveling back from Iowa, correct? I believe so. Yes, uh, Lou. I heard from Betty Backer. Yes. And her sister is not doing that well. So okay. I don't know her name, so you'll just have to say Betty's sister. Yeah, we can pray for Betty Backer's sister, of course. And of course, Alan, I think, would want us to pray for Judy Ivy. Mm -hmm. As I do. And uh, Billy and Mary Lou. Okay. 
Thank you, Luke. Um, yeah, we have requests from Alan for Judy Iverson and uh, Billy and Mary Lou Rhodes. Yep, we got them. Thank you, Alan. Um, I can hear you, Darren. What's up? Uh, continue prayers for Crystal. Okay. And, um, sad news. Um, my friend Jerry, uh, his two adult children decided on Friday to turn off his life support. And I uh, found out he died just after midnight this morning. So prayers for his mother. Um, she was kind of blindsided by that action. So... Prayers for his mother, uh, the loss of her son. Did you get all that, John? I did. I'm sorry for your loss, Darren. Thank you. Anyone else in Zoom land? I believe so. All right. All right. Well, let us prepare to lift up our hearts, our souls, our innermost selves as we prepare to approach our God through the gift of prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Lord, we lift up our hearts this morning and we come to you as your children because you tell us to do so. And we do so not out of fear. We do out of love. So, Lord, we pray for our world, especially in times of pandemic. We pray for the nations that they might be, um, that they might be well, that people who are ill will receive their treatments that are needed, that vaccines will be given, and that people will be safe. During these times, we must think of our neighbors. It is important because we do not live alone. We live all together. We are one family, the human family. So we lift up prayers for people all around our globe. But we also lift up prayers that even though this pandemic is raging, people still are dealing with other issues. We pray for the hungry. We pray for those people who do not have shelter. We pray for the oppressed. We pray for the innocent that are caught in between uh, gunfire and violence. We just pray that violence ends, that hatred ends, that bigotry ends. Lord, teach us how to live peacefully. It is a lesson that we have never seen to learn. Teach us, Lord, how to really love each other as neighbors. Allow your gospel, Lord, to spread over this earth, teaching people what it means to love you. Let people see the power in your salvific message. Lord, we pray for our nation. We pray for our government. We pray for our president and our courts. We pray for the women and men who create laws and enforce them. We ask them to be fair and just to all people living within our land. We pray for those people who serve overseas, in our military, or in the Peace Corps, or on your mission field. It's difficult to be away from the familiar, friends, family, loved ones. Allow your spirit to be felt. We pray for our first responders, we pray for our police officers, our firefighters, our EMTs and paramedics, we pray for our postal workers, we pray for the truck drivers who carry our food from distribution centers to our stores. We also pray for those people who have been considered essential, people who work uh, retail or restaurants or grocery workers. We thank you for them and their sacrifice as they have been working every day since this has begun. So please keep them safe. Lord, we thank you for people in our medical field, our medical professionals. These people from doctors and surgeons 
all the way down to nurses and aides and people who work desks and do administrative work and to the people who scrub floors and, and clean rooms, doing their part to keep this virus down. Lord, we thank you for all of them. As they have been working tirelessly for us, let us lift them in prayer, thanking them for what they have done for us. Lord, we also thank you for the people, uh, thank the people who have uh, come up with uh, the vaccines, from the people who created it, to the people who produce it, to the people who distribute it, to the people who administer the vaccines into our arms. We thank you for all of them and we pray for that chain, that it stays strong and that Americans can continually be vaccinated against this horrible um, pandemic. So Lord, we are so thankful. Lord, we lift up our city, Bloomington. It is our home, the place we love. We just ask that you continually be with our town. We ask that you continually be with our students, which are a huge piece to uh, what Bloomington is to our state. So we pray for our students who come from all over our country and some from across borders. We ask that the students who have done a wonderful job at being safe continually do that job and be mindful of this uh, pandemic. We also pray for the locals who live here. And so we just ask that we all remain safe as uh, we call this place our home that we love either permanently or uh, when school is in session. We thank you for all of our local mayors and our governors throughout our land for the work that they have been doing. We just ask that always they keep in mind their people and their vulnerable people throughout this pandemic. Lord, now we lift up our personal prayers to you. And as always, we are thankful that our prayers do not fall upon deaf ear. We lift up Miriam and we pray for her hand that it might heal. We also ask that uh, she be given the strength not to pick at it. We also lift up Sue Lormer who is doing well as she is uh, doing her therapy up in Indianapolis. We ask that she continually have the strength to do her therapy, that she is given the opportunity to rest and heal, and um, that she stays positive, um, and that, we see that, that she sees some uh, good progress in her, her leg uh, and her arm. So we pray for Sue, we miss her here. And so we just lift her up and ask that she continually heal so she can come home. Lord, we lift up traveling mercies for Alejandra and Suhail Haddad as they are traveling back from Iowa from spending time with their good friend Nancy. Allow them to return back to us safely. We lift up Betty Thacker's sister who is not doing so well. So we lift her up in prayer that, that uh, you heal her and, and tend to her needs. We pray for Judy Iverson, uh, that she is doing well. Lord, you know her needs. We lift them up to you. We also pray for Billy and Mary Lee Rhodes, our uh, matriarch and patriarch of this congregation. That, um, as they are sequestered in their home, we just ask that they remain healthy and safe. Um, and they also remain positive as uh, getting out and around is not as easy for them as it's not for any of us, so we just lift them up in prayer. We pray for Melanie's friend and former co-worker, Crystal, that as she is receiving treatment uh, for bone cancer, that you keep your healing hands upon her body, that you heal her, um, that the, the treatments that are designed um, to treat her do as they are designed to do. So please be with Crystal. Give her the strength to continue with her treatments. And finally, Lord, we pray for the family of Jerry as uh, Darren's good friend has passed away um, as he has taken off the respirator. Um, we just ask you to be with his family, be with his children who had to make that decision, and be especially with his mother who uh, did not see this coming. So please be with Jerry's family as they mourn and celebrate his life. Please give them that space uh, to do so. Um, Lord, uh, we just ask you to be with Jerry's family as this is not an easy thing 
um, and especially be with those who hurt. Uh, please be with Darren um, as he mourns the loss of his friend and uh, be with any of Jerry's friends and um, family who now mourn the loss of his life. So please be with all of them, Lord. Lord, we are so thankful that you are with us when we hurt, when we mourn, when we dance, when we smile, that you are a God of every season, that no matter what we are going through, you are with us, comforting us, celebrating with us, smiling with us, weeping with us. So for that, we are eternally thankful. And you know the prayers that are on our hearts even before they leave our lips. And for that, again, we are thankful. So, Lord, as we prepare to close this prayer, let us use the words that you taught your own followers so many years ago. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed, heaven, hallowed be, be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom come, come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Uh, just a quick reminder um, that uh, if you are able, uh, please uh, consider giving to your church. Um, uh, the year is starting out like it, it starts out every year. Uh, of course, we need your giving, uh, and we thank you for your continued generosity. Uh, it is through your generosity uh, that we are having church and that we exist. So we thank you again for your generosity. Uh, you can either mail your giving uh, to the church, which Alan will take care of when he's here at the office. You can pay online. Um, you can use a credit card machine downstairs. Um, again, we are just thankful for your generosity. It is through your gifts that we are here. As we prepare uh, to close the service out this morning, and as we are about uh, to go out back into our communities, let us consider again the question to fast or not to fast. And that is all up to you. As Lent is a communal project, right? We do it together. We do it as the church, and not just our church, with thousands of churches across our land and with churches that span overseas. We are all going on this journey together with millions of Christians. But it's also up to you what you want to do. How do you want to take this season and turn it into an active devotion. That is your decision to make, how you want to tackle that. And I don't care what you do, as long as you do something, right? As long as you translate it into an action. Because that is all about what Jesus' ministry is, right? Jesus encourages us to action. So whether you want to give something up, whether you want to take on a devotion, whether you feel that, well, I have a behavior I'd like to stem, or I'd like to, to do something that is more healthy, or get rid of something that is damaging to my body, whatever you want to do. I mean, it, it's your decision. You know, whatever you choose, you know, make sure you, you do it with a smile, and you continue throughout this, this period of sacrifice uh, by doing it positively. And remember that you do it together. We do it as the church, and we do it walking side by side with our Lord. So do it, whatever you wish to do, do it, and do it with a smile upon your face. As Jesus says, wash your face, look, look good, put a smile on, don't let anyone know that you are fasting, and go about your daily business. So you go, and you fast in any way you'd like. May God bless you, may the Spirit be with you, and may Christ 
walk with you hand in hand throughout this season of Lent. Amen. church, the medieval church, I mean, it's just, it's fascinating yeah. that we sing something that was written by someone so long ago. Um, yeah, 1529. Yeah, which is, he, think about his, his actions, whether you look at it as the Great Reformation or the Great Revolt, depending on what side you're on, it, it's monumental, it's historical, uh, both for the church and secular history. So, I mean, 